If you have your Bibles, then turn with me to Genesis in chapter 9. Genesis in chapter 9. And we'll be reading together the first 17 verses of Genesis 9. And we're starting to look at a topic which is dear to my heart. The topic of covenant. But let's pray before we come to reading God's word. I ask, O Lord God, that you would give us ears to hear, that you would speak, and you would tell us exactly what we need to hear. And by your grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit, may these wonderful people here hear a better sermon than the one I'm about to preach. Give us grace for all that you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So Genesis 9, just tiny bit of context. The waters of the flood have washed clean iniquity on the earth. And God has reformed and refashioned a new earth, as it were. And now he will establish with Noah as a new kind of Adam. And he will instruct Noah and he will establish with Noah his covenant on the earth. So that's the context, Genesis 9 verse 1. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. You can hear the echoes of Genesis 1, can't you? Or to Adam. The fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every bird of the heavens, upon everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea. Again, there's echoes, but there's something slightly different this time. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And for your lifeblood, I will require a reckoning. From every beast, I will require it. And from man, from its fellow man, I will require a reckoning for the life of man. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the cloud. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. That should, that should give us a real joy every time we see the bow in the sky, shouldn't it? Yeah. That it's, it, it's God's promise. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. May God bless the reading of his word. A covenant is simply a contract. A covenant is an agreement between two parties. We do have covenants in our day, whether we call them that or not. Marriage is a covenant. If you buy a house, you sign a contract. Even if you want to buy a mobile or rent a mobile phone or enter into any kind of contract, you sign a covenant. But when it comes to the Bible, covenants take different shapes and forms. Sometimes they are only one way obligations. This is what God is going to do. And sometimes they have two way obligations. Covenants may, may include conditions or not. They may be 
administered by one party or by two parties. They often include the promise of blessing and the threat of cursing. God's way of relating to his creatures is by covenant. There are covenants throughout the Bible. The most famous are with Adam, with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with David, and the new covenant. We, don't, we didn't talk about the covenant with Adam. It isn't labelled as such, but we know from Hosea, chapter 6, verse 7, but like Adam, they transgress the covenant. So we know that the arrangement that God established with Adam in the garden was a covenant, which goes by various names. If you study your Bible, if you study theology, you'll come across this, that it's often called a covenant of works. Not because it was absent from grace, it was God's gracious initiative to establish the covenant, but it was a covenant of works wherein God promised life to Adam and his descendants upon the condition of perfect and perpetual obedience. So God promised something and Adam was was to obey perfectly. That is why it was originally called a covenant of works. The eternal life, the the fellowship in splendour, in the garden before the fall, to walk with God for all eternity was conditioned on their obedience. That Adam could eat from any tree, but he could not eat from one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It was a covenant of of works, But the first use of the term is not in Genesis 1, but in Genesis 6, verse 18, when God says, I will establish my covenant with you, to Noah you shall come into the ark, your family with you. So the first use of that Hebrew word, bereth. And it may be that chapter 6, verse 18, is an introduction to the fuller expression we see in what we've just read in chapter 9. Or as I'm slightly inclined to think, a separate covenant in chapter 6, he is saying in a very simple way, I promise you I will not destroy you and your eight, these eight people, but you'll be saved through the ark. It could have just been a very simple covenant. And then the fullness of the Noahic covenant is chapter 9. We're going to try and move quite quickly through a number of big ideas and show what is going on in this covenant with Noah and why it matters more than you might initially think. So I'll ask six questions and then briefly, and I promise you they are very brief, five points of implication and application at the end. So what is the setting is the first question. What is the setting to the covenant between God and Noah? Well, we saw that the flood was not only a destructive force, but it was an unravelling of creation. We looked at that last time. Genesis 7 11, it's easy to remember because it's 7-11. On that day all the foundations of the great deep burst forth and the windows of the heavens were open. It's similar to Genesis 1. So in the act of creation, God separates the waters and he puts the waters restraining the deep. He restrains the waters in the heavens. So what we have in the flood, Noah's flood, if you like, is the unravelling of that created order. And then as the waters abated, it wasn't that it was just dry land, but it was depicted as a kind of recreation. And just as the ruach of God, the breath of God, as creation is hovering over the waters, so in chapter 8 we saw the ruach, the breath of God, over the waters, blowing forth to create dry land again. So in chapter 8, God is putting back into place his recreation. But this is what happened after God completed creation in chapter 1. Remember he looked and said, behold it is very good. And then on the seventh day he rested. Well we have something similar here in Genesis 8, 21. When God smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. It is not the same as we're going to see throughout our passage. It's tainted by sin. It isn't the perfect world where he says, behold, it is very good. But he accepts the offering from Noah 
and he takes a kind of rest, as it were, after this new creation week. So we have the unraveling of creation, and we have a sign that this is a new creation. Last week I mentioned some brief parallels between Noah and Adam, and in Bruce Waltke's excellent commentary, he says, both worlds are formed from watery chaos. Both Adam and Noah are associated with the image of God. It isn't like the image of God shows up very often, actually. Only one, chapter one, chapter five, and chapter nine. Both Adam and Noah are said to walk with God. Both rule over animals. Both are told to be fruitful and multiply. Both work the ground. Both followed a similar pattern of sinning. Adam's was in eating, Noah's is in drinking. And the results of both their sin is embarrassment at being naked. Both have three named sons, and both sets of sons divide into elect and non-elect the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. So we have a new kind of creation, and Noah is a new kind of Adam. Just as God established a covenant with Adam, he now establishes a covenant with Noah. In Genesis 9, 8 17, just in those few verses, we have this word bereth in Hebrew covenant seven times. The whole section is about the covenant between God and Noah. There's similar language, Genesis 8 21. I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from its youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. That's the covenant promise, and it's repeated in Genesis 9, verse 11. I establish my covenant with you, and never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. So there's a thematic tie, God's singular covenant promise that he will not destroy the world again with a flood. So we have a new creation, a new Adam, but it's not identical. The covenantal goal in Genesis 1 and 2 is eternal life, to live forever with God. Just don't eat the tree. But they ate from the tree, so they died a spiritual death. And then coming into the world is physical death for the first time. In other words, Adam and Eve did not accomplish what God gave them to do. They didn't fulfil the creation mandate. So from Genesis 3 onward, sin has come into the world. And it, the world becomes so corrupt that God had no choice but to wipe out the earth save for these eight persons. So we have a covenant, but it is not the same kind of covenant that we have with Adam. We have like the creation mandate re that is redrawn up, given to us in a new way that accounts for a world that is filled with sin. When I was preparing this, it seemed to me like it was a new kind of normal. It was different. There's a new kind of normal. We unfortunately have to get used to a new kind of normal every few days these days, don't we? There's a new kind of normal. I trust we don't forget what it was <laughs> originally like. But, it may, it may, but the point being is we get used to a new kind of normal. And it's sort of, some things are like what they were and you can go some places and do some things, but they're very different. You know, we have to put our masks on rightly to do so. It's not the same. And so we have here, God in this new kind of normal, with a new kind of Adam, is given is giving similar commands, but taking into account that sin has come into the world. Sin has now come into the world. So Noah is like a new Adam in a new world. So God establishes a covenant with Noah that is like and unlike the one with Adam. Secondly, that's the setting. Secondly, what does God promise in the Noah Noahic covenant? He promises preservation. 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 
He promises he will not destroy the world again with a flood. He will not curse the ground in the same way. And it's not that the curse of Genesis 3 has been removed. That's a different Hebrew word. But the Lord is saying, never again will I do on the earth what I did in the days of Noah with the flood. And as a result, part of the preservation is that there will be a predictability to days and seasons, to the weather, to seed time, to harvest, to summer and winter, to day and night. They shall not cease, lest the people live in constant dread that at any time the world might be wiped out by a flood. <clears throat> the Lord says, I promise to preserve you. You'll have food to eat. That's why in Genesis 9 verse 3, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. As I gave you the green plants, I give you everything. He gave them animals to eat, not just plants, but food from animals. It makes sense that God would enter into a covenant with these people. But God is gracious. He doesn't subject the world to slavery, but he promises he will not do the same thing again with a flood. So it's a promise of preservation. Thirdly, what is the sign of God's promise? The sign, most of us call a rainbow, but it's called a bow in scriptures. We see it in verse 13, verse 14, verse 16. It is a natural sign, whether it appeared on the earth with the rain before, or whether this is the first time. We don't know, but God says, from now on, the bow in the sky will be a sign to you. I don't know about you, but every time I see a bow in the sky, I think of God. I think that's God. That's God. And there's something important about the sign. And this is going to be important as we flesh out some of these other points. It is perhaps the only major sign. Now, this is not a sacrament per se, but it's sacramental in the sense it provides a sign that tells us of God's grace. Would you do that every time you see the bow in the sky to think of God's grace? And in distinction to the other signs, it has nothing to do with the shedding of blood. If you think about the other signs, circumcision clearly has to do with the shedding of blood. Baptism in the Old Testament has to do with remission of sin. The waters of baptism has an echo of the shedding of blood on the altar in the Old Testament. The other New Testament sign is communion, the shedding of Christ's blood. And its parallel in the Old Testament is Passover, the shedding of the part of blood of the Passover lamb. And this sign has nothing to do with the shedding of blood. It's a different sort of sign for a different sort of covenant. It is a bow in the sky. I know that the rainbow has been taken for a very different sign in our day. It's a sign for sexual revolution. And so, unfortunately, you have to be careful how you display your affinities for rainbows. If we were to put rainbows in our windows, it might convey a different idea. But I want you to be really, really clear that it is a sign from God, first of all. It was a Jewish Christian symbol, and we should never give it up. It's a precious sign that God gave, so that when we see the bow, we're reminded of his grace. Not only to us, not only to us, but to all of humanity. It's God's grace to all, to all people everywhere. It's possible, though we cannot be certain, scholars speculate that perhaps the bow because it is the same word that the rest of the Old Testament uses for an archer's bow, for a bow and arrow, that it's a way that God is, the, Lord is, the Lord God is saying, my hostility with the earth has ceased. I will never again destroy the world with a flood. And there's a beautiful picture of hanging up the warrior's bow in the sky. Hanging up the warrior's bow in the sky to say, I'm no longer at war with you on the earth. Whether that's the case or not, it is explicit that the bow is a sign. And notice for whom it is the sign. We often think of the rainbow as a sign 
to us. But it is by, by implication a sign for God. Did you, did you notice that in reading? It is, it is verse 14. When I bring the clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember, as God speaking, I will remember my covenant. Verse 16. When the bow is in the clouds, I will remember. The, language, the Bible is using language we can understand. And I'm, maybe I spoke to you about this before. I use some big words, antro, I can't even pronounce them anymore. And my friends laughed at me for trying to say them because they know that I struggle with even saying canine. So, but it's not that God forgets things, that, has, that God has a mental lapse. But to remember is for God to be drawn towards the objects of his affection. To recall the promises that he has made. So by implication, that rainbow says something to us. But God says, first of all, it was a sign for himself. That God would look upon the heavens and see the rainbow in the sky. And say, I have promised to all living things, never again will I destroy the earth in a flood. What is the sign of God's promise, that bow in the sky? Fourth question, how long does the covenant last? It says at one point it is everlasting, but the Hebrew word olam, for everlasting, is not a technical word to mean from eons to eons, but for the foreseeable future, for a long period of time. And here it means until the end of the age, as we know it. So that's the length of the Noahic covenant. Genesis 8, 22, while the earth remains. Sea time and harvest and so on. In other words, the Lord's promise is not that he will never be angry with sin. The promise is he will not judge the earth. It's not that he will not judge the earth, but rather as long as the earth remains, God will not destroy the people again with a flood. In 2 Peter 3, the scoffers, the false teachers in Peter's day, were saying that there was no judgment to come. And you see it all around us today. People are saying, there's no judgment to come. And therefore it doesn't matter how you live today. You can be sexually free. You can do whatever you want. Jesus isn't coming back. There is no judgment. And Peter said in his day, and it would echo clearly today, you could not be more wrong. You could not be more wrong. 2 Peter 3 verse 5, they deliberately overlook this fact. That the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, and through water by the word of God. And that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. The argument that Peter was making, and we do need to hear this, is they were, in Peter's day, they were living and moving and partying and doing life as normal in, the, in Noah's day. And a flood came. So in the world today, there will come a judgment, but not of water, but of fire. So Peter says there clearly is coming a day of judgment. We've been confessing, we've been saying in the Apostles' Creed that Jesus... Christ is coming again to judge the living and the dead. I wonder if every time you say that, you believe that. Because the Lord's promise in Noah's covenant was not that God didn't care about sin, or that there wouldn't be judgment for sin, but as long as the earth endured, there wouldn't be a flood to wipe out the earth. So what Peter is saying is, what's coming at the end of time is not a cleansing by water, but by fire. So the Noahic covenant is God's promise that as long as the earth endures, God will preserve it. And number five, the question, with whom is the covenant made? This is quite key, chapter nine. The, the major covenants in the Bible, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and the new covenant. And this is the only one that is not made with God's people alone. The covenant with Adam is made with Adam, Abraham with Abraham and his descendants, Moses with his people, David's for the line of David, and the new covenant for God's new people. 
And this, of all the covenants, is made not just with the promised line, but with all people everywhere. And, and this point could not be made more emphatically. Look how often this is mentioned. Behold, I will establish my covenant with you and your offspring. And then in verse 10, with every living creature. And then again, verse, verse 11, all flesh. And verse 12, between me and you and every living creature. Verse 15, every living creature of all flesh. Verse 17, between me and all flesh. This is the only major covenant that God has established, not just with his people, but with the world, with all creatures, even to the animals. In other words, this is a covenant of common grace, not a covenant of special grace. Common grace, it includes the godly and the ungodly. It includes animals. It's a covenant not of redemption. There's no promise here of salvation. There's no promise of forgiveness of sins. There's no promise of eternal life. It is a covenant of preservation. There is one covenant of grace stretching from the old to the new, whereby sinners are saved by grace through faith. And this one covenant of grace is established most particularly in the promise to Abraham. The covenant with Noah also comes from God's grace. The idea that Noah and his family are alive is because of grace. Because of the fact that God is not going to punish the wicked people on the earth with a flood again, is God's grace. But it is a different kind of covenant than the one covenant of grace. Bavink, one of the theologians, said, he said that this covenant with Noah, though it is rooted in God's grace and is intimately bound up with the actual covenant of grace, because it sustains and prepares for it, is not identical with it. It is rather a covenant, covenant of long-suffering made by God with all flesh. It limits the curse of the earth. It checks nature and curbs its destructive power. The awesome violence of water is reined in. A regular alteration of seasons is now introduced. It's common grace to all living things. And as much as we are inclined to scan the world in which we live and think, well, how could things possibly be worse? Have you ever thought that and then it does? <laughs> and you, you often think, well, how could it get any worse and then it does? Well, it could be a lot worse. Because throughout most of, most of human history, in most places, it could have been worse. Everyone everywhere, whether they accept it or not, enjoy common grace from the covenant with Noah. If you think about it, a basic fearfulness of animals towards human beings, the preservation and propagation of the human species. Most pointedly, God hung his bow in the sky and has stayed his hand of final judgment. Talking about this, just by the way, I, I read it, this is an interesting article in, in the Times this week by a guy called Ed Conway, who is a, who is a Sky News commentator, who spoke about, you know, about the, the birth rate rapidly going down. It's rapidly going down for human life to, um, you know, to exist. It's, I don't know, I think it's something like 2.1 or something, they say, you know, um, average, and now it's something about 0.6 or something. It's really low. So, I mean, you know, we, we shouldn't... Th th these things you know, are spiritual in nature, which come from the Noahic covenant, a covenant made with all living things. Six, what does God require in this covenant? There are no covenantal conditions per se. There's nothing like do this and li you shall live. There was a condition in the garden, but there are obligations. And I just referred to it just then. Number one, fruitfulness. It's repeated in verse one and in seven, be fruitful and multiply. God is starting over with Noah. And the blessing of children and the obligation of reproduction is put on the human race. Food. I give you animals to eat. But there's a limitation. You shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. I want to be quite clear here. It's not a commandment how you cook your steaks. This isn't meat here, you only eat meat well done. 
but the lifeblood refers to the distinction between the way humans ought to eat their food and animals ought to eat their food. Humans do not eat their food as animals. They cook it. And it's not a commandment about how you cook your food, you'd be glad to know, but about the distinction between animal life and human life and how humans are different from animals. We're not beasts. Remember the commandment in Genesis 2, the prohibition was about food. You cannot eat from that tree. This is a prohibition about food, not with a tree, but the sort of way in which you can eat the animals. God has put this common grace blessing, the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth. It doesn't mean that you can't be hurt by animals, but it is generally the case that there is an uneasy existence. So it's different than have dominion subdue, where Adam can in Genesis 2 have all the animals parade before him and give them their name. It's now a world of sin. And thirdly, fellow man. From his fellow man I will acquire a reckoning of the life of man. Again, we have the repetition of the phrase, the image of God, in verse 6. We have the establishment here of the principle, which is given with the Latin phrase, lex talionis, which is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, which sounds to us very barbaric. But the principle in the Old Testament was a principle of restraint. It meant that justice had to be proportionate to the crime. Genesis 4.24, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. That is the way of unbridled sin in the world. We see it all around us. You hurt me, I kill you. You injure my eye, I slaughter your tribe. That's the way of sin. That's the way of Cain. That's the way of Lamech. But here, the Lord institutes proportionate justice. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. Christians do differ on the interpretation of this. I don't want to go into that. But the Bible, I believe, gives the category here for capital punishment. Not as an affront to the image of God, but because of the image of God. And in verse 5, the emphasis is not so much on man's rights as an image bearer, but upon man's responsibility. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. Again we hear echoes of Genesis 1 with the language of the image of God. But in Genesis 9 we take into account sin. So there are God is saying there are three requirements, I believe, in the Noahic covenant to be fruitful about food and about the way we treat a fellow man. But in closing, let me just give you five quick thoughts. We see here in the Noahic covenant, first of all, that there is a realm under God's provision and preservation, which nevertheless is not identical with his saving purposes for his people. There is a realm under God's provision and preservation, which is still under God's control, still preserved by God, but it is distinct from the saving world we see in Abraham. Secondly, the world of common grace is not independent of God. There is a natural law that comes from God's covenantal action. Under this realm of common grace, it is not independent of God, but God still establishes rules for all people. Thirdly, God's commands and provisions in the Noahic covenant presume a world of sin. The chief difference from Genesis 1, Adam, with Genesis 9, Noah. Genesis 9 envisions a world of conflict. It envisions animals killing humans. It envisions humans killing humans. It envisions the need of justice, because there will now be injustice. And it envisions that God will need a sign in the heavens to stay his hand of judgment. The worst schemes in history have always come from those who think you can make heaven on earth. If you think about you know, the Soviet Union in, in, the, in the 20th century, people who thought that they, by their own strength, could create heaven on earth, the beginning of any sort of cultural advancement of proper government must be with an awareness we live in a broken world. You have to have that. Because we live in a world of conflict and sin. 
We do not live in a utopia and we will not bring heaven on earth. However you voted last year, did you think that you were voting for heaven and earth? If you did, you were very, very misled. Fourthly, we see in the Noahic Covenant the basic building blocks of cultural achievement and the basic building blocks that will later be fleshed out throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, the proper role of government. We see what is necessary for civilization: the support and nurture of the family. If you're going to be fruitful and multiply, there must be a structure that supports and allows for human flourishing. Romans 13, the governing authorities serve two main purposes, to punish the wicked and reward the good. And we see the beginnings of it in the Noahic Covenant, which is not just God's dealing with his people in Israel or the church, but with all people and all places and all times. But I want to close with this, the fifth point. In light of Genesis 9, let us give thanks to God for his common grace, but let us recognise our need for special grace. There are many reasons to be discouraged. I personally would advise don't you know, limit your news intake. It doesn't do you good. It doesn't do your soul good. But there are many reasons to be discouraged. The media specialises in telling you things are worse and things are terrible. And so as easy as it is to see these things, we ought to give thanks to God for his common grace. His common grace that he hasn't judged the earth, that he's restrained his own hand of just judgment, his common grace in giving us blessings and bounty and prosperity, in many freedoms that we've enjoyed in this country. Thank God for his common grace, his preserving covenant with Noah, which is still in effect. But at the same time, in this broken, sinful, fallen world, the covenant with Noah is not enough. As much as it was a blessing of preservation, there is no promise, there's no way back to the garden. And like the first Adam, Noah is going to sin. And by the time we get to chapter 11, the people again will be dismissed and dispersed because of the sin at Babel. And God will have another plan because this covenant with Noah, as good as it is, and a reason to give thanks, is not God's plan to save a sinful people. This is not the way back to the garden. Brothers and sisters, there is a judgment coming. Not a flood, but a fire. And we will all stand before God. And we will need more than the covenant of preservation. We will need a covenant of special grace. The grace that comes by faith. And God has provided a way back. Our Lord Jesus Christ. So confess your sin, repent of your sin, believe in God's beloved Son. That's why I read John, and I encourage you to read this afternoon, listen this afternoon. By faith we are children of Abraham, and by faith there is a better Adam to come. And Jesus will be given a command, and this time will be faithful in all God's house. May it be your portion that you know Jesus as Saviour and Lord the way back to the garden, for his name's sake. Amen. Now we're going to close our service and I encourage you to listen to words of this wonderful hymn.